So I'm um, super excited to uh, welcome you to the salon for the spring 2019 cohort of students. Um, my name is Zach Lieberman. I'm one of the co-founders of the School for Poetic Computation. And we do this salon uh, every time we have a 10-week session. And so we've been doing this year, um, not year, but every year for, for several years. Um, the school is... Um, six years old at this point, which is kind of amazing to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, very quick, in, in a second I'm gonna introduce Lauren, um, who helps run the school with me, and she has a bunch of shout outs, and she um, and wants to kind of up, uh, get some updates on all the amazing things that have been happening in this space. But just to um, qu quickly explain where we are, we're in the West Beth Art Center, which is a really amazing um, venue. And uh, the bathrooms, just for your um, edification, are around the corner. So uh, you probably saw them when you came in, but just if you need, um, if you have any problems or any concerns about anything, just come to us if, you have, if there's any issues. Um, but we're really lucky to be here. Um, and the idea behind the salon is to invite a, a collection of speakers um, in a way to give the students some kind of starting points for things to be thinking about dur during the term. So I'm so excited to um, invite these speakers up to the stage in a second. First thing I'm gonna ask you to do though is stand up. And I want you to put your right hand in the air. And I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody that you don't know. <laughs> and you might have to move around if you're surrounded by, by your friends. <laughs> yeah. And, and now I want you to put your, your left hand in the air. And um, this is my, uh, yeah, for, forgive me for those of you that are holding beer or cell phones. Um, and I want you to put your left hand on the shoulder of somebody else that you don't know. And, and I'm going to take a picture because this looks amazing. Um, and now I want you to really quickly introduce yourself and make a new friend. <laughs> yeah. And then when you're ready, you can have a seat. And um, I, I would show one thing and then I'll, I'll switch it with you. Okay, so um, Lauren is going to just quickly introduce what's happening in the course of these 10 weeks. Um, I do want to say that one of the things that um, we really like this event is a, also a kind of welcoming for the, these students that are joining us. Um, and I was in a car on my way here on Canal Street, and I saw this crazy thing, which I think is like, I, I really wanted them to like come here. It was so crazy. It was a, uh, it was like a bus with a marching band. So I feel like kind of what we're doing here, the, 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 the point of this event is to really like welcome in a really big way all of these brave people who have come to the School for Poetic Computation to study with us. So um, unfortunately, I was like, I kept being like, how amazing if this bus would actually come here. But it turned, it, I was behind it and, and yeah, we separated. But um, anyway, super excited to introduce Lauren to um, give a, also a kind of overview of some of the things that have been happening because a lot's been happening in this space. Yeah. Tight spot. Okay, I tried to Google if it was possible to make a slideshow in just like a Google Drive folder, but it's not. So if anybody here works at Google. <laughs> I'm going to change one. Do you want me to change oh, yeah. the resolution setting? Yeah. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Uh, right. Just drop my laptop. That's awesome. <laughs> System preferences. All right. Whoa. OK. We are really professional over here. Not screensaver. Displays. 
option, scale, 1080i. Sure. How's that work for you? Right. Okay, thumbs up. All right. Oh man, yep, cool. And then Zach just taught me this trick. Hold on. Two fingers, two fingers. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So I'm gonna try to multitask since you can't actually have it run for you. So hi, my name is Lauren, and I help run the school with Zach and Taeyun. I was a student in 2014, and then they just couldn't get rid of me, which is really nice. Um, we are celebrating our fifth year. Actually, I think it was last year. It was actually last year. We're a little late. Uh, we're still celebrating our fifth year. We're celebrating our sixth year. And, uh, and with that, we're trying to do a lot more programming and trying to be a lot more open and accessible to everybody. And we've gotten a lot of requests to do shorter classes. Um, so I wanted to share with you, uh, while I also show you pictures from the student showcase from last semester, and this will make more sense in a minute, um, but I'm going to try to uh, do two things at once. Right, so I'm going to tell you about what we were doing last semester as a way to entice you to think about what you would like to come to SFPC to do if you were a student and you have the time. Um, in January, we did a, oops, sorry, in December, we did the New York Tech Zine Fair. This is all since the last showcase that we had, which was last September. Um, the New York Tech Zine Fair was organized by Taeyun and a few other people, and uh, we had over 500 attendees in this space. Can you imagine that? There was a line like down the, the block. It was really well attended, and I think that they're going to try to figure out a way to do that again. In January, we celebrated another Code Societies, which is a three-week program organized by Melanie Hoff. And had a bunch of teachers at that one. That was really cool. I think that she's going to try to do another one this summer. So if that uh, interests you, then please sign up on our email list, because that's where we send out the announcements first uh, before we put them live publicly. Uh, in February, we did a code paper scissors for the very first time. And that came out of some uh, classes that we actually ran during, I think, the spring of 2018. Um, that was taught by Kelly Anderson, who's going to be speaking tonight. And so maybe she'll show some of the work that they did in that session. It was amazing. As well as Robbie Kraft. Um, and yeah, Robbie and, and, and Kelly organized that one. Yeah, and they can talk about the other teachers too. But that was amazing. And I think we're going to try to do another one of, of that, which is great. Um, Nabil, who I don't think he's here, uh, but he's going to be TAing for us again this session, did just a short weekend. Um, called Mathematics as a Religious Experience, and we still have some of the work and flyers around, and I think that we're going to try to expand that into a, a longer program. That was really fascinating. In February, we also did Movement, Memory, and the Unconscious Resource, which was a workshop by Corey Kresge. Uh, in February, for the very first time, we opened up the boat camp, uh, boot camp for new coders. The, uh, maybe we could do a boat camp. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that was really cool because we actually had um, people attend the boot camp who weren't part of this 10-week intensive program. In fact, I see some of them here. Hi, how's it going? Um, and so that was really exciting. We're going to try to figure out a way to do that on the weekend. So if you want to learn open frameworks in a, in a wonderful environment like this, then, then please stay tuned or let us know that you're interested in that and I'll try to schedule it. Uh, in March, uh, we are doing Put Into Words. This is actually going to be Next weekend, I believe it's sold out, but if you like it, then let us know and we can do it again. Um, it's a writing class for artists and technologists by Joanne McNeil. And then now we've just started our intensive, which is the spring 2019 session. And the reason that I'm showing all of these pictures is to also entice you to pay attention to the upcoming programs that we have. So please mark these on your calendar. Code Ecologies, I completely forgot one. I'm so sorry. See, we've been doing a lot of things. My bad. Um, I don't even have that written down. I'm so bad. I'm so bad. I'm so sorry. OK, all right. Um, and I think we're probably going to try to do that again during the summer. I know during the summer we're going we're gonna to do a lot. So please stay tuned to our email list. 
and let us know if you have any interest in the things that I was talking about or that I haven't mentioned, and we'll try to figure it out for you because we're excited about learning too. Um, but most importantly, next Wednesday, the 20th, you will get to meet all of the students from this session, and we're really excited by that. Um, this is a way for us to kind of get to know each other before they go into the long haul of working for the next 10 weeks really hard with our teachers um, and TAs. And uh, I want to give a shout out to some of the teachers and TAs, or all of the teachers and TAs, if I can, if I didn't forget anybody. Uh, this session, we've got Zach Lieberman teaching Recreating the Past with our TA, Matt Jacobson. Um, American Artists will be teaching Dark Matters, which is a critical theory course with Nabil Hassan. Electronics is going to be taught by CWT, somewhere over here as well. Uh, and Thierry and Sebastian are TAs for that. Scrapism is taught by Sam Levine with Fernando as the TA. And we have Artist Toolkit and Showcase, showcase Prep, uh, which is what I'm trying to go through here. I'll just keep going. And that's taught by myself and Taeyun Choi. And we're going to have workshop and guidance from Celine Katzman and April Soderman, who are also here as well. Um, but most importantly, I want all of the current students to do me a favor and just raise your hands. Awesome. These are the people that you should say hi to. And the students, can you guys turn around? And also for the previous students, can you guys also raise your hands? Awesome. So you're family. You just don't know it yet, but you're all family. And you might even recognize some of these people in the pictures up here. Alexander Miller, I'm reading off the names of the current students. Ariel Osel, Bomani McClendon, Greg Sedetsky, uh, Javier De Asuke. I asked everyone if I could pronounce this right, but I'm not sure if I am. Joseph Wilk, Juan Miguel Marin, Luisa Fabrizia, uh, Mar McMahon, Melissa Holmes, Sarah Khan, Sheldon Chang, Stephen Pelican, Stephanie Shermer, Vivian La, and Ye Wan Song. So please do uh, say hi to everybody and come back on the 20th. And then also mark down May 11th and 12th for the final showcase so that you can see all the beautiful things that these students are going to make. Stuff like this. Cool. Thank you. So, um, in, ad in addition to the 16 lovely students, we also have a dog named Atta, which is also joining us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so our first speaker tonight is um, one of the co-founders of the School for Poetic Computation. And um, I I've had asked to meet when I've been teaching f for a long time in New York, and I always have a meet come in to talk to my students. And he'll do this thing, which I find really incredible, which he'll come in and he'll put one image on the screen. And he'll ask the students a question about the image. And I'll have a whole conversation, basically have a whole course just starting with like one provocation and he's one of the people who I just love to hear from the most and I'm excited to invite Amit onto the stage. Yeah. Hi everybody. I'm just going to set up. Sound. Yes. Oh, can I plug in sound? Sorry. Wake you up. Uh, wanna do HDMI directly? Or here, let me let's go ahead. This one. We may need um, system preferences. Can we allow? Yeah, it should be fine. There we go. Okay, cool. Right on. Perfect. Hi everybody! It's great to see to just to see everyone. It's, this is this is incredible. Um, so every time that's right, I don't have one image. I guess I have this image. I'm I'm wondering. I'm wondering if I should just show the video. I'll show the video in a minute. We'll do an experiment first. So I want to talk about experimentation. This is very very strange. Um, Can you hold them? Up? Yeah, sure. Better? That's great. Can you hear me better? Excellent. Okay. We're sorry. All right. Hi. All right. Leo, I stole your. Uh, I stole my son's card. I'm. I'm a meat. He's Leo over there. <laughs> um. So a funny thing. A funny thing happens. I've. I've. I've been. I've been writing code and and writing it for uh, for pleasure and profit for many years now. I can say 
maybe over 20 years now. And it took me a long time uh, to, to just realize what's going on. Um, and I've been teaching for a long time as well. And, um, I, you know, you get to this realization at some point, and the realization I got to is um, uh, the less of me, the better. Anybody ever got to that? When you realize the less of me, the better? You know, I, I started realizing when I look back at what I do that every time that I try to do something, I totally mess it up. Just like it just doesn't, doesn't work out. But I'm very uh, comfortable walking backwards and kind of like falling on couches that I just want to sit on for a long time. Um, and, uh, and I think the method, the method of, of work that comes out of that that we all are familiar with is experimentation. Experimentation is, and, uh, and I think that, that um, uh, I've just become comfortable with the fact that, that maybe, maybe that's, what I, that's, that's what I do, that's, that's what many of us do, and, and, um, and we should celebrate, celebrate that for what it is and think for a second about all the things that it has done to the world in the past, people experimenting, people not taking things for granted, people stepping away from dogma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but decouple that from intent. You know, I don't know how many people intend to do anything. So, uh, so anyways, every two years or so, um, sometimes it's four years, sometimes it's five, I kind of reset what I do. And about three years ago, I joined Google. And Lauren, I have no idea how to fix your slides. Um, <laughs> um, so I joined this place called Creative Lab. I've, I have not worked for a large corporation before. This is, this is, this is a new thing, so I'm going to try a new thing, right? Um, and... <laughs> and I was like, what should I do there? And, and I ended up um, um, working together with a team and, and just creating, just like taking a bunch of experiment sites, some of which have been happening at Google from uh, before I came, like Chrome experiments and there was Android experiments. And I thought, what if we just put them all, we decided to put them all under one site that's called experiments with google.com and just, just celebrate experiments you know, for what they are. And so we did this thing and we, we put these collections there. Right, so there's experiments that you could do. For example, we have some like really fun machine learning experiments where we're going to show you what machine learning is in the browser in real time on your machine to be able to train things, right? And you can play with that, and then, and people can kind of touch machine learning in a visceral way rather than a mathematical way. And so there's another collection about about Android and about Chrome and about AR. And are you noticing something about all of these collections of experiments? And these are submitted by, by people like ourselves who, who get into an experimental mode and they want to do something. And then sometimes our team does a few things and we collaborate very often. But what do you notice about these experiments down here? They're very what, they're very what centric? Yeah, they're, and they're very technology centric, right? Like AR is a technology. Chrome, they're they're we sell it. We we experiment technologies that are our tools and our sandboxes of experimentation. And at some point, we, we got curious about what if we try to to do experiment that start from a different place, that are not necessarily technology centric. That they they bring technologies together towards a purpose that isn't the technology. And how would that look like? Not not that there's anything even a bit wrong with celebrating the technologies. In fact, so many of us find that as our fuel to go and do amazing things. But what happens when we flip that? And, um, and, this, and, and, so, and so through an experiment about an experiment, this came about. So I'm going to show you a little video and I'll talk a little bit about this. Hi, I am Tanya. This is my voice. I use Morse code by inputting dots and dashes with switches mounted near my head. As a very young child, I used a communication word board. I used a head stick to point to the words. It was very attractive to say the least. Once Morse code was incorporated into my life, it was a feeling of pure liberation and freedom. See you later. I think that is why I like skydiving so much. It is the same kind of feeling. Through skydiving, I met Ken, the love of my life and partner in crime. It's always been very, very difficult just to find Morse code devices, to try Morse code. This is why I had to create my own. 
with the help from Ken, I have a voice and more independence in my daily life. But most people don't have Ken. It is our hope that we can collaborate with the Gboard team to help people who want to tap into the freedom of using Morse code. Gboard is the Google keyboard. Um, what we have discovered working on Gboard is that there are entire pockets of population in the world, and when I say pockets, it's like tens of millions of people who have never had access to a keyboard that works in their own language. With Tanya, we've built support in Gboard for Morse code. So it's an input modality that allows you to type in Morse code and get text out with predictions, suggestions. I think it's a beautiful example of where machine learning can really assist someone in a way that a normal keyboard without artificial intelligence wouldn't be able to. I am very excited to continue on this journey. Many, many people will benefit from this, and that thrills me to no end. So that was an interesting experience uh, from meeting somebody who thought that Morse code might be a good idea to put in two billion phones and such and have it in everybody's pocket to explain to people why would you ever try to do something like that and and to to work with Tanya to try to make that a reality and there was a big question there in our minds of how do we how do we do this how do we how do we convince Google to go and put Morse code inside you know, inside keyboards, uh, you know. So when you go into your keyboard, you have Morse code as the thing that you're typing, right? Like this, instead of letters, right? And um, it wasn't very hard. Apparently, there was a lot of excitement for this sort of idea. And then the question was, well, if you're gonna build this, how do we know what to build exactly? And, and we got to the point where we realized that Tanya should really be the person who shows us what to do, she should kind of lead the project and we should just figure out what we can do to, uh, to make that happen, right? And once you get into that, and this is all very experimental, but being able, this is something that I haven't experienced before, being able to take that whole experimental mindset of let's try to see what happens when we try to blend, you know, an Android ubiquitous phone with, with something that, that is, uh, is niche. Um, and what happens when, when, you, when you say something like this through, through a megaphone, right, that can reach so many people, that um, we started learning some really interesting things and Tanya started showing us some really interesting things. One of them, one of the things we learned is that, that once, you, once you do that, the next hurdle is that most people don't really know Morse code. <laughs> and, uh, and that includes, let's say, parents of, of children that might benefit from using Morse code to communicate. So suddenly there's a new experiment, which is, is there a way to make Morse code easy to learn, and uh, which is you know, entirely you know new thing. And again, this is this is more about people than it is about technology. Um, but um, so we re so we we realized that that interestingly, typing Morse code and listening to Morse code are completely two different things, and one is much easier than the other. And actually, typing Morse code is something that there you could learn with methods, and people have taught people like how to do this uh, using visual mnemonics. So I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, a you can imagine an archer, you know, like an, and then a dot and a dash, right? And then that's what A is. For T, you can imagine a piece of tape. Oh, I already played the game, so it's like, uh, ah, but it knows I couldn't get anything done, so it, so it lifts it up. So I'll try to remember a piece of tape. That's a dash. What's an A? Archer dot and a dash, right? E, what do you think an E is? What does E stand for, could stand for? I, the iris in the eye, the eye, so think about a dot, right? And what's an E again? What's an A? There you go, whoops. That's a W, here we go. And what's a T? All right, so you just learned three letters. You don't have much, many more to go. And so this thing in about 20, and this is we've we've tried this with hundreds of people in about 25 30 minutes you'll be typing morse code on you know on on your phone and you won't even realize why you're doing it it's 
it's quite you know and, but and, and it's incredible and but if you think of and if i just showed you this project out of the blue it would be like why the hell is you know it's it's a fun little experiment project but where it really becomes interesting is within the context of this right and so and so this experiment sort of grew and 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 uh and we ended up uh, we ended up working with um, a place here in the city that's about 15 minutes away from here, that's called the Adaptive Design Association. Have you heard about the Adaptive Design Association? So what so so what happens once you start going down a rabbit hole like this is that you start meeting more and more and more fascinating and unbelievable people that that you've always been next to but you've never actually had a chance to meet, you know, or reason to meet. So this project brought us to uh, to a woman named Alex Truesdale. Do you mind if I play one more video? I swear it'll be the last one. All right, and then I'll tell you a little bit about this place, and, and I'll encourage you to come and visit it. We are about breaking limits. What we do here is make sure people get the custom solutions they need to do whatever it is they need to do. If the catalog doesn't cover it or the store doesn't cover it, it's got to be made. We would use any material to solve any problem we possibly could. We've been working with Morse code on and off for 30 years. It's a powerful tool because it's so simple, yet so robust. It just takes two inputs, a dot and a dash. If a person is able to activate a switch, whether it's with their head, elbow, foot, tongue, that becomes a means in which they can communicate to the larger world. Morse code has just become available on Gboard, which opens the possibilities for so many more people. Now the biggest barrier is just convincing people that Morse code is easy to learn. We are at Adaptive Design, helping them host their first ever Morse code accessibility game jam. Family, our first Morse code game jam. For this game jam, we partnered artists, designers, and developers with some of Adaptive Design's younger clients to create personalized, bespoke games for them to teach them how to use Morse code. When we met the developers, didn't know what to expect from him and what his capabilities are, and I think that when he was demonstrating what he can do, it pleasantly surprised him and sparked a lot of ideas and inspired them. I actually don't have a background in accessibility at all. I was really intimidated at first because I thought, um, you know, I didn't have the skill set really needed to do this. But what I found over time was that actually the skills that I brought to the table could go really far. I just needed to listen to the kids, the family, their team. You can go a long way in just a couple of days with that kind of mindset and attitude. We hope that developers get involved with Morse code and start designing with families and kids so that Morse code can become widely available and people can have custom communication solutions wherever they live. For developers who want to get involved with accessibility, I would advise them to look around because there are organizations doing this kind of work in every city and state. to assure you if you wanted to explore accessibility and you felt worried about it, use that, bring it with you and say it, this is the first for me. That's very real and that isn't done enough. Yes! That incredible. Like so, so, what's amazing about about Alex, who who also got the MacArthur Genius Award about I, I think twenty or uh, twenty years or so. Um, there's actually a clue in what's amazing about the work that she does. Anybody notice anything about the furniture? It's all made out of cardboard. Uh, what she's been doing for years now is that people just come into the Adaptive Design storefront, which is up on thing on Thirty Fourth Street and Eighth, and um, they come and they say, well, my, you know, I have a kid and, and my kid, the school is telling me that the kid cannot feed themselves. Uh, and so there's a person there that will probably feed my kid forever. And then Alex looks at the kid and, they, and she walks and she goes to the school and she hangs out with the family. And then they go and they fabricate something out of cardboard that survive like three ply cardboard that survives for 25 years and more. And in, in three days, the kid is feeding herself because of some simple ergonomics of setting up the cardboard. 
And that's her MO, and that's what she does. And she does it over and over and over again, one person at a time. And what she realized at some point is that that computation is, and this is how we meet, that she's actually used Morse code before and hacked before with Morse code as well. And what she realized is that computation has reached a point of cardboard, right? Do it yourself, what we do here at the school, the capability to go and try things and experiment with things and to see what works. You think about that 30 years ago and the amount of technology that you would have to wield and the knowledge you would have to have just to be able to wield that technology versus today. You know, it would be the same. It would be the same thing as, let's say, casting iron to make a sculpture and making something out of foam core or cardboard. And she saw that moment where experimentation with technology has made that shift between casting iron to working with cardboard. And that's when she started bringing technology into the practice. So it's cardboard and hackery, right? Which is, which is what an incredible pe person, people first experimentation sort of attitude to have, right? And so, and so the work that she does now also includes going and having, working with people like ourselves and going and building solutions, bespoke solutions. And once in a while, some of these solutions go and become widespread innovation, which is quite, quite amazing as well. And you can go and talk to her about that as well. So, I would have never gone to um, this rabbit hole if we didn't start with this time with experiment with Tanya together with Tanya and and I feel like it's just expanding expanding just this little, little idea of like what if we sit down and talk to people we we haven't necessarily met before and see what they have on their mind and use our little cardboard technique to do something for them so I I feel like that's what Zach and, and Tayun and, and Jen and I had in our, our mind like with this place as well I think six years ago, it's one of one of the things is um, well, the people, the people, you know, the people together, you know, being in a small room and 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 figuring out what to do and and figuring this out without without a set agenda, um, and then which projects come out of that. Um, and this is where I'm going to lend this. I, I I kind of feel like I come home into this every time I come here, and uh, and I hope that the new students that are starting now, I hope that you. You sort of share this ethos because it's 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 been carried around and executed by Zach and Tayun and and Lauren like for for all these years and and it's quite an, an incredible thing to go to go through. So enjoy your rabbit hole and enjoy your experimentation. And thank you for uh, letting me talk to you today. This is interactive. We can talk. We can speak with each other. Any questions? Yes, please. So, building the first prototype. Um, uh, Jane and I built it in an afternoon. It wasn't it, that wasn't hard at all to build a little Morse prototype. Uh, bless you. F figuring out figuring out um, how to get that integrated with this amazing Gboard team took a little while longer. Like I would say about like three months of of work, which is incredible to get something into a product that's that's going out to so many people it was incredible. And then and then there were another I would say couple of months of um, um, doing things, things like making this poster along the way and understanding what we were talking about, about creating a language that, that anybody can hang and, and learn. That took some time. And another really interesting thing that started happening is we, we started realizing, like through experimentation, that there's an autocomplete, right, in Gboard. And what if we added the same autocomplete to each one of the, created a special Morse code for each one of those options? You know, Tanya, it takes her a little bit of time to go and, and, and get even with Morse code there. So we realized that we can, we can significantly reduce the amount of strain that, that she could use by just having, giving her good autocomplete once she starts typing. And then that brought a bunch of other settings. And she, all of these settings are settings that she talked to us about and she told us to build. And that took another, another couple of months to go and implement and understand how to do those things. Once, we, once, we, once the wires were connected and we started seeing the accumulative um, uh, good cycles that are happening, then we just kept working for a couple of more months on that as well. So I would say overall, I would say it's something like 
six to eight months from from beginning from tight experimentation to getting it out there on a phone and maintaining it and making sure it's it's rock solid yeah yeah Within that framework, yeah, exactly. no, I think it's just my silly analogy. But but I think I think I mean I don't I mean if you think I'm I'm happy you think it's serious enough for somebody to write something about. Oh, so yeah. that's cool. Um, yeah, I think so. You can you can look at the history of cheap materials, right? In almost any craft, and it's really it's 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 interesting and machining and the tools that that allowed for those materials to happen and who had access to them. So I would say I'm going to answer your question in opposite. Instead of talking about where I think it could go next, let's just let's, take, let's, let's look backwards and let's also use that analogy, let's say, for access. For example, the first people who had access to computers at all were people who had access to what? Where were they? Where were they actually? No, even before that, the military. The military. You had to have a military background and accreditation and security just to touch a computer, right? Then things got a little bit better and, and it got into the top universities if you were super lucky and you had to like and you had to like get a lot of training, right? And the first and the first awesome stuff done with computer that isn't missile trajectories was people doing what? They, they, were, they were doing video games, but they were stealing cycles. They were like at peril of not being able to touch the machines again. If they do that, they would they would just like sneak in there and, and steal computer cycles to go and build Pong or, or Pong was even too complicated for that sp space war, thank you. And and so, and then it got a little bit better and people who had enough, and the, who had enough money and had maybe a little terminal in their you know, in a place that isn't too far from the university. So maybe now you don't need to have, like, you know, a lot of money and accreditation and training just before you, you do that. And it goes further and further and further until you get to the right click on a computer, view source, start working, right? This is where we are today. Somewhere between the tools and our, in, like, like, it's interesting how this stuff just wants to become that, right? So, yeah, it's exactly, it's gas filling a space, exactly. And... What you're seeing is in this movement from missiles to right click on view source, right? Stuff be can become cardboard because to support that, you need layers of abstractions that allow you to go and build the cardboard, but keep, still put it down here and have other people interact with it and sit on it, et cetera, right? And I think, that's, and I think that, that to me is really interesting, the, the connection between providing access. And by the way, I have to say, I. I just said right click on this computer as if this is it. So here's where it goes next. They're not, not, you know, how many people don't have a computer to right click on, don't know about the right click? This is like, we're not there yet. We're not even close, right? We are very privileged to be here in this room knowing what, what, for, for this to be a common language when I can say right click on the computer, everybody's like, ah, you know? Like this isn't, like we're in New York, this is not the norm and so, and so where it could go next is I think the more we open access to technology, the more cardboardy it will allow the thing to be. And the more than we will be able to do for other people. This like this sounds like too lofty, and I'm, I'm just going on a trajectory. But what, what does that mean, for example? It means that I was privileged enough to go and be able to meet Tanya and have the tools to build some cardboard things with her. But what about the communities that I haven't met, about the people that I don't know about? or that I don't currently see or care about, right? Just to be crass, right? As I do care, but really do I, yeah, right? Absolutely, it's, it's physical, right? Wouldn't it be awesome if they could, if, if that person in that community had the same access that I had, and that's the next level in cardboarding, right? Because they should, they should be able to do this, right? I, I, so, so I think, so if, so if you look at the history, and then you can set the trajectory and then you kind of see what, what the next part of it is. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank you for uh, Yes, last, last question is like I promise. I, I can keep going. I can, I can come back some other time. Um, <laughs> anything for, for blind people? Yes. Um, I, I, let's talk a bit, let's talk again in a couple of months. I can't just talk about it right now. But I will talk about um, something for hard of hearing. Um, 
there's a there's a uh, there's some amazing work being done with ASR right now and and allowing people to just listen to a room. Oh, in fact, actually, sorry, I I misspoke. There's another. There's there's. I'm not going to go through this, but I highly recommend going to Creatability. Yes, we have we have work with Chancy Fleet uh, from the New York Public Library. And she's she's shown us how like we've worked on projects together that allow people to get very creative with their browser, um, and we have we've worked with Chansey who who is blind. We've worked with folks who are hard of hearing and motion impaired, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and uh, you can see some of those projects there. But there are some really interesting things coming up on the other end of the trajectory of like from experiment to product that I that I'm very excited about. We can talk about soon. There's something like a. a live transcribe which came out for Android where you just take a phone out and it transcribes anything that's anybody who's talking it just transcribes it in real time very big letter so so a person who's hard of hearing can just put it there and just see what's going on in the room so that just came out that's an example of experiment to product and more things like that are in the works yeah that we we just released something called look i think it's called uh lookout is, is the product name for it which is that like uh um when i say we don't mean the creative lab some amazing people at google accessibility they created this lanyard and you put the phone in the lanyard and you just walk around and the phone just describes whatever it sees uh so that that just came out and you know the interesting thing about those things i'll say is that it's just like with the morse code and the 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 autocorrect the more people use it the better it gets the more the more the machine learning learns and and, and understands the person. So we're excited to see it out there because it starts a certain path. I'll, I'll stop here because we have amazing speakers coming up and, and, and I, I want to hear them. So, but thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. I heard speak at the, um, it was the machine learning literacy event at um, Pioneer Works and I loved everything about her talk. I kept taking photographs almost every slide I was taking photographs and I was tweeting them and uh, people were retweeting them and I was just really um, I just was really excited about her her message and, and what she was talking about. So I'm really thrilled that she agreed to come and speak to us all today. So let's all welcome Janice. <laughs> It's Linux, so who okay. knows? Okay. All right. Um, do you have a uh, display? Oh, right. Display. display. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is have a sort of a Mac presentation before the break, and then after the break, we'll have the Linux presentations, which is give us a second to debug our uh, our 
chain. So, okay. Okay. Let's go. okay. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, Actually, hold on. Let me try one more thing. Oh, okay. Because sometimes you have to, like, not mirror it. But... Oh, okay. I can see it down there. Kelly? Um, Maybe let's do it. No ports, but yeah. Oh, with no ports. Okay. It's all right. All right. I got it. Don't worry, Zach. <laughs> um, and Kelly is one of. Um, she's a, a designer who, um, whose work I, I really admire because she um, she combines craft and um, kind of a, an exploration of craft, oftentimes through paper craft. She makes amazing pop up books, um, many of which you'll see if you you know if you're in the MoMA bookstore, or um, there are books that are um, turned into cameras, books that are planetariums. Um, she has spoken at SFPP before, and she shows crazy, um, all of these crazy um, references that she draws on for her work, and I just love listening to her talk about her work, and I'm kind of fascinated with everything she does, so I'm excited that she's here. Um, and she also, you just ran a program here, so. Yeah, yeah two, I a, did. A two-week program here, so. Oh, yeah, welcome. Thanks for having me. Do you need sound? Yay. I do need oh, sound. Okay, you're right, you're right. But I think I got it. Okay, um, check your sound setting. Just make sure that it's that's going to headphone and not watch the mind. Okay. Oh, and yeah. then maybe etching, do you have it? Or do you need me to set it? You need 1080i? Okay. Oh, okay, we have to adjust okay. some, yeah, some more sorry. things. Sorry. Um, can I mirror or not mirror? Don't mirror. Don't mirror. I just want to see my notes. Okay, all right. Just in case. See. We can do this. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Tenny the eye. Achim, are you happy? He's happy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And sound. And sound. We can check yeah. sound. And sound should be output headphones. Perfect. Oh, sweet. Okay. Awesome. Rock and roll. Cool. 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 Awesome. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm Kelly. Um, I'm the person that Lauren mentioned in the introduction when she said we had just done this code, paper, scissors class and that I might be showing work from that class, which uh, I had brought in my standard portfolio talk without work from that class. So I just like kind of like loaded up some slides here at the beginning to explain what that was. Um, so Robbie Kraft, who's a computational origami artist, and I um, co-organized this class called Code, Paper, Scissors, which was all about thinking about paper as a tech rather than a craft. You know, normally when you talk about paper, you think about it as a craft, but, um, you know, folding is a way of like programming paper materially um, and paper has a, a memory. So we kind of wanted to go into all of the different potentials that paper has as a tech. So um, it was Robbie, um, my friend Simon, who's an amazing uh, paper engineer, pop-up book guy, um, Pam Liu, who is really like interested in the connection between um, weaving and punch cards and computation and was able to like bring that entire history together. And um, then also Coralie Gaucheron, I know I'm mispronouncing her name, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we did this the entire class. But um, she makes these amazing, like this is a, uh, she works with Conductive Ink and this is like an amazing paper speaker module um, that runs off of a nine volt battery that she created. So yeah, it was uh, it was pretty interesting. So to just to get you into this, this subject matter a bit, um, this is a series of prints that I made about paper as tech and it, they're all uh, they're all riso printed, uh, and so they they function to on the one hand like totally deform type in this fun way. 
But they also talk about different ways that these different folding patterns are being used um, in different tech applications. So uh, there's this very common origami pattern called the water bomb. This is like a slightly modified version of it, but it's being used to make these little you know, fine tuning antennas for different types of technology, which is pretty cool. Um, Miyoriori fold. Has anyone ever folded a Miyoriori? Super fun. Yes, Stefan has. <laughs> Stefan was our TA, so yeah. It was so fun. Um, yeah, so it basically, if you fold a Miyoriori fold, you're taking paper, which is a material, and you're turning it into an auxetic metamaterial, which is a fancy way of saying that if you stretch it in one direction up down, it also springs out left right, which is a behavior that's rarely seen in nature, which is difficult to engineer using typical engineering materials, um, but you can get from a piece of paper out of the trash and fold it this way. Um, and this was invented by Corio Miyoriori in uh, 1970. Again, I'm not good at pronouncing names, <laughs> but um, but yeah, and it went on to hold uh, to go up on like Japan's um, in sp Japan's space flyer program's solar array, which is like floating in outer space. Um, the way that the different panels of Miyoriori move when stretched uh, is a method for tracking the sun. Uh, on solar panels, which like works a lot better than other methods that they've come up with. Um, oh, this one's a, this one's cool. It's a sync sequence fold. So it uh, demonstrates this idea that you could potentially sequence different folding patterns together to get different functionality. So this one has Miyoriori on the left and right, um, which like lifts and lowers this uh, <laughs> sequence of blocks and the blocks in turn like act as a spacer. So just thinking about like, oh, could we like remake the entire world and all of its tech, like in this non-dominant modality of, of tech, um, like, you know, what would happen like if we didn't have cars and instead like the road like wiggled people along or something like, yeah. So this is what we did in this class. We're like, what if? Um, but, you know, it, it was also like a, a way to talk about an alternative philosophy of, of programming like um you know normally when you talk about uh like the choreography and programming or the action and the process um it's a result of imposing a specific order and when when you take paper as an entry point to tech um it's sort of like you know, the choreography comes from a place of, of craft. You first have to work with the grain of the thing. You have to make observations about its inherent capabilities and behavior, and then engage material and function simultaneously in like this more like collaborative way. Um, so, yeah. And I put this up today. Um, so this is a whole bunch of different paper mechanisms. Um, it's up at cutfoldtemplates.com and yeah so each one has like a vector file that has cuts and fold lines on it it's very I'm very good at literally naming things cutfoldtemplates.com um, if you go to the about there's also a description of the course and um, and links to everyone involved so yeah there's a lot of these there will be more okay so um how did we get here? Uh, what is this large automobile? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm Kelly, I'm a graphic designer who's clearly lost. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think I arrived at this place of like thinking about paper as tech um, because there's historically been this duality in my work, which I'm like slowly and elegantly merging together. Um, I really like to explain invisible things, invisible forces. So this, this work of doing data visualization is all about bringing facts from the abstract or numerical realm into the realm of perception. So you can like see and feel and experience those facts. And the other part of my work's duality is that I'm really obsessed with building things that seem like magic, but have no hidden parts. And there's a lot of like lo-fi magic that exists firmly in this realm of novelty. Like you see it once, you realize it's a trick, and then you're never fooled again. <laughs> like my cat, like after this moment, never thought this was a wolf, <laughs> which made me sad. But 
Um, but I realize that there's actually like an opportunity to things behaving in ways that surprise us beyond novelty. So um, like, you know, magic occurs when the world demonstrates that there's some blind spot in our understanding of something. And one blind spot that we seem to reliably have is that we just don't understand how we as humans work and we don't understand how perception works. Um, so this is a book that I made based on some research by a Swiss scientist named Emin Gabrielin, which uses moray interference patterns to create this illusion of magnification when the screen is rotated. Um, and it seems to reveal like some fancy glitch in the material, you know, like maybe there's some other layer in here. Um, but really what it does is it highlights a glitch in our perception, basically. Um, if you've ever like been like driving down a road and you pass a sign and like it's partially obstructed by the limbs of, of trees, you can usually still tell what it says or what's on the sign. Um, and it's because our, our brains have this amazing capability for filling in the blanks. So they see a shape and then they, it's sort of like their best guess about like what is the block shape. Um, so if you have a very regular uh, grid with a regular period of dots cut out of it and the same grid underneath it, as soon as you start rotating it, your, uh, your brain is like, oh, it must be a bigger dot. It must be a bigger dot. And so that's where this illusion of magnification comes from. So I like things that are really super simple like this, but um, sort of disprove, you know, the simplicity we sort of attribute to it. Um, so this is a, a holiday card that I made some, some years ago, and it comes with no instructions, but I was able to like use paper's material memory to guide people through the experience of the card. So when you first pick it up, it's clear that it wants to like flop in these specific ways. And people eventually see that like flopping it brings them through this simple story. And it's a story about itself. Um, so the card's literally like a four frame documentary about receiving this card. <laughs> and I love it because it's kind of as simple as material could get. It's a single piece of paper printed front and back. Um, but, you know, it's still just kind of like bends my mind. Like I can understand it from frame to frame, but not the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I feel like, you know, we, we all sort of expect like high tech, high production value projects to wow us, but you don't really expect a piece of paper to wow you. Um, but because the infrastructure of the physical world undergirds even like very, very simple material things, you know, you can kind of like tunnel into that complexity and, you know, shape your paper um, to tap into forces like, you know, you can shape it like a kite and it can catch the wind or um, like a megaphone and it can amplify sound or, um, you know, you can model complex mathematical com uh, ideas and origami. So it kind of like provides this tangible interface on these realms of the abstract and invisible that are, are difficult to like get at otherwise. So, um, you know, there's, there's always these like two entry points to knowledge. Um, this, for example, you know, is understanding a Mobius strip. So this is a Wikipedia page that tells you what a Mobius strip is. But has anyone actually made a Mobius strip? Oh, good. Yeah, we have a critical mass. Um, so basically, to make a Mobius strip, you take a strip of paper, you twist it once, and then you tape the end together. And if you start drawing a line down the middle of it, it ends in the same place where it began. So you just turned a two-sided surface into a one-sided surface. Um, so this is another way that you could understand a Mobius strip. Um, and this is the more accessible way, I think. Um, it makes a lot more sense in paper than it does on paper. It's more that the information is like more bioavailable that way. Um, and a real world example of this uh, is this practice of, of translating unsolvable folding and unfolding problems in science and engineering into origami, um, which Eric Domain is really at the forefront of, of these things. Um, and this is sort of like a way to open up 
complex problems to the superpower of, of human tangible intuition. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, there's a really good documentary called The Origami Revolution um, that dives into it. But, you know, some examples of folding and unfolding problems. Um, for example, like by what pattern should airbags best be folded up within your steering column so that they're most like rapidly unfurl upon impact? Um, or like proteins and, and D, protein and DNA sequences like come folded. So thinking about like what are the fewest places that you need to cut um, a protein sequence so you can unfold it and keep like most of the sequence intact. Um, the New York Times last year, or I guess it was at the end of 2017, had this long article about how, you know, these researchers had finally figured out like how ladybug wings worked. You know, that they're like these deployable structures that like fold up. It's amazing. There's a lot of like very slow motion footage, but um, it was just kind of like this amazing moment because I was looking at this and I was like, wow, we have like a sports car floating around outer space and we just figured out like how ladybug wings work. Um, so in um, my own work, I realized that I could get much farther in thinking about complex problems myself if I found a way to get my brain and my hand to work in tandem um, and allow me to like feel things out as I thought about it. So um, to solve complex problems, I often make little paper devices. Um, for example, like as a freelancer, I often feel overwhelmed by all the factors at play in deciding whether I should take a job or not. Um, so I thought I might do better in this world if I just like outsourced all of my difficult questions to a paper calculator. Um, so I made one and this format is called a Vovel. And before there were, you know, computers or even calculators, there was still this, this need for calculation. Um, and this one is called the farm calculator. So it's sort of like helping you plan out, you know, if you want like 15 bushels of asparagus in the fall, like how many seeds do you buy? You know, so you turn the little wheelie thing, select 15, and then it's like, okay, buy 500 seeds, plant them now. Um, yeah, so these things were kind of like, the apps of the 1800s because they like did one calculation really well and like nothing else. <laughs> but it was really fun because uh, you know it's it, there are these series of nested and cut wheels um, that selectively show and hide information. Um, so like all of the math has to be translated and embedded into like the physical structure of this thing. Um, so yeah, that's the way it works. Like basically, you know all possible answers are on the back. And then the wheels that get layered on top of it are just a process of like winnowing down those answers and like honing in on the one answer um, that you wanna give people. So mine, um, I called the existential calculator because it was designed to solve my existential crises. And it's, um, you know, programmed with social science research about what makes people happy in work um, and what leads to a midlife crisis which basically boils down to four main considerations. Um, what are the working conditions? Uh, is the project a good fit for you? Um, will your work actually improve the world or is it bad for the world? And will you make money? So you basically answer those four questions, which are all like a matter of degree. Um, and then you get a little answer in this little wheel right here. So this one's red. And so then you flip it over on the back and there's this massive key. So <laughs> you find your color and you trace a line out to the perimeter of this thing. And like all of the lines you cross are conditions that, that apply to you. Um, so if you end up in the red zone, it's like this really positive, like total creative freedom. People are just throwing money at you. It's like a great fit. Uh, you might touch the void. Uh, yeah, and then like the brown brown zone over here is sort of like the the crummy, crappy jobs where you're like not making ends meet, you're not doing something you believe in, it's not good for the world. Like, um, yeah, so you know everyone's done like an online test before, and it's really not that different than that. But I think that um, the fun of this is, which really like highlights the difference between like 
digital and analog space here is that um, you can see this whole spectrum of work. So if you end up somewhere that you don't really want to be, you can flip the thing around again and like jigger the answers to end up where you want to be. Um, and so it sort of like facilitates this whole philosophical conversation with yourself about like what you value in work and what seems positive and what seems negative. Um, so yeah, my friends have done this before and they're like, oh, it was totally right. And I was like, yeah, but like, it just doesn't know anything you don't tell it. So it's kind of like a dumb piece of paper, but a useful dumb piece of paper. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think about this a lot. Um, why these like lo-fi things are still interesting and engaging in a world um, of advanced tech. Uh, and I started thinking about this question a lot um, more than any human being should when I uploaded this project to the internet. So this was a while ago, it was in 2011, and some friends of mine approached me to make their, their wedding invitation. And I somehow convinced them that they needed to send all of their people paper record players instead of like legitimate wedding invitations. Um, but you know, the reason why was basically because like they both loved music. So we wanted to try some, find some format um, where, you know, it could be, could be musical. And I had these memories of Mr. Wizard where he made the most amazing thing. Um, he simply took a piece of paper, rolled it into a cone, taped a needle to the end of it. And that was like necessary and sufficient to amplify these grooves on the record where this information was embedded um, into sound you could actually experience. Um, so I saw this when I was a little kid and I it blew my mind and fortunately I have good taste in friends and my friends also had seen this as children they're like oh yeah this is a great idea. <laughs> so uh, we all got on board um, but then the onus was on me to like figure out how this thing to make this thing work so I was like wandering around Manhattan, buying up needles from everywhere, like going to Chinatown, buying all the acupuncture needles, um, going to the garment district, getting all the sewing needles, um, calling paper manufacturers to try and find the paper with like the best sound quality. And um, yeah, they thought it was crazy. But meanwhile, um, my friends, Mike and Karen, uh, wrote this really adorable song inviting guests to the wedding. And we had it, um, put onto a clear flexi disc. So like most records are made out of vinyl, they're opaque, they're thick. Um, I wanted to use a clear flexi disc so that we could print um, this likeness of, of Mike and Karen in black on the surface and then have like all of the color printing below it. And that way it would be interactive in this way that if you turned it 90 degrees, like every 90 degrees, you like complete Karen and Mike in this different situation. So here they are playing music together, another 90 degrees, and they're eating and drinking and being merry. And then growing old together in old person clothes. <laughs> and this was a design decision that was made strictly based off of fear because I had tested all the materials, I had ordered everything, everything was coming in and it would all theoretically work, but like, you know, you never know. Like it, it's possible that, you know, the one needle works, but then the five, batch of 500 I got were like made in a different factory and weren't going to actually amplify the sound or I don't know, I had all these nightmares. So um, this decision to make the complete the picture was basically a design justification fallback in case it didn't actually work as a record player. So yeah, yay fear. Um, but it did work. So um, people got the invitation and it instructs them to fold the page in half. And there's a needle right where that red dot is. And so you put it on the record and turn it at 40, 45 RPM. This is what the real song sounds like, just for comparison. Yeah, I was like so happy when that worked. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it was the funniest thing because like, 
I, I was really happy that it worked. Mike and Karen were really happy that it worked. But then we uploaded it to the internet and it was like a crazy like feeding frenzy. Like it was on daytime television. It was in Oprah's magazine. It was like everywhere. And it was kind of like, well, like all my friends and I are like sitting around complaining about like the sound quality not being good enough on Spotify or there not being enough albums in it or something. And this thing, it like plays one song, it's super glitchy, it doesn't even sound good. And like people are freaking out about it. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I felt like I had stumbled upon a very interesting question. Um, and so I thought and thought about this and I realized that there's this like weird dimension in our relationships with our things that um, modern tech largely doesn't provide yet. Um, so, you know, modern tech gives us what we want, anything that we ask for really. Um, you know, it, it, it fulfills this, this stated desire to ease the burden of humanity and do our work for us. This is a, a paper cutter at this uh, shop down the street from me, which is like hilarious. It's like this guy like turning back time. And of course someone drew a dick on it, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, but it, you know, what it can't give us is what we, we don't quite understand about ourselves yet, um, which there's so much of. Um, and the power, power of this, I'll illuminate with an example. So uh, Brett Victor writes about uh, the scatterplot graph as being one of these like really, really important inventions in human history that's kind of been, been overlooked. Um, and what a scatterplot graph does is it makes information sort of like bioavailable to human perception. So, you know, humans don't think like computers. You can't take a spreadsheet of information and shove it into someone's head and have them make any sense of it. Um, but as soon as you take the spreadsheet and put it on a map, um, then you're making it possible um, for people to, to fall back on hundreds of thousands of years of uh, evolution and practice in, in navigating physical space. Um, so we're able to like fall back on these tangible reasoning skills of distance and proximity and like actually be able to see patterns and relationships and outliers um, and what's the highest point and what's the lowest point um, and understand like all of these relationships hidden in data at, at a glance in a way that you'd never get from a spreadsheet or require just a ton of mental work. Um, and that superpower is really like what helps us intellectually feel our way through the world. Um, you know, we intellectually think about the world through our bodies and through touch like much more than I think is acknowledged. Um, you know, if you think about the, the nervous system, it doesn't end with the brain alone. It extends all the way out to the skin. So all information, not just the touchy-feely stuff, um, even technical information flows in through our senses. <laughs> um, these, all of these, these videos are um, paper stop motion animations that I made for my friends at TinyBop who make these educational apps for kids where there's like no stated goal. You're just sort of like dropped into the body and like you're allowed to like freely explore. So they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, so like humans are simply hardwired to have these like very deep, very rich intellectual and philosophical um, lives through our, our tangible exchanges with things. So bringing back to tech, like, you know, when you're talking about like old mechanical tech that's like fussy and glitchy and and crappy and like not delivering on the promise of like easing our burden really because I have to like mess with this antenna for an hour. Um, it's frustrating, but it also like connects us to the larger physical world around us, you know? So like when you're messing with a short and something, you're like dealing with electricity or when you're messing with an antenna, um, you're dealing with radio waves. So, you know, as an artist, when I'm working on like an animation project, um, you know, I get a lot of feedback that like, there's like glue in there, I could see a string or whatever. Um, but I really, I really like it and I leave it in there. Um, and I try to get the viewer's sense of touch like engaged. Um, Cause I, I, I feel like those things are kind of like meaningful palimpsests of like how the thing was made that, um, you know, helps like connect my experience and making it to your experience as a viewer. 
So like this one, um, you know, where the bird's like flying in my hands, like guiding the string, like my, my hand is kind of like a stand in for yours, you know, because we all have those, those kite flying experiences. Um, I just feel like it adds like another like entry point beyond the visible, beyond um, the information that is sort of sneaky because I think we don't think about touch as being as important as it is. Um, yeah, so that's why people were into this. Um, you know, we, we all remember learning about how sound works in school, you know, that I'm speaking, I'm disrupting um, molecules in the air in a wave that like comes in, like hits your eardrum and your brain interprets that as sound. But something about like actually experiencing it as a demonstration where your hand is like touching the record and the sounds coming out in syncopation with the record um, really like made that abstract information like real for people. Um, so yeah, that was sort of my, my revelation that I took away from that. So now um, as a designer, I, I try, um, I try to like give people as little as I can, you know, kind of just like a pile of paper <laughs> and, you know, allow them to like unlock what's cool about it um, themselves, like by putting it together. Um, so I've been trying to facilitate this experience by like teaching myself paper engineering. And so far I've been making pop-up books. So this is the, this is the first one that I made. It's called, this book is a camera, which is like a really super literal title uh, because it is a camera that lives in a pop-up book. Um, and the way that it works is that you put photo paper in the back of it in the dark, and then you lift up this dark slide, which allows light to go through a pinhole and hit the paper in the back to expose it. And then you go back into your dark closet and you can develop it with um, instant coffee and baking soda. So yeah, it's a, uh, but it also like, uh, let me see, yeah. It's also diagrammed to like show how light works um, because there's really not a way to observe the tendency of, of light outside of like a camera obscura. Um, so yeah, it, but it takes pretty good pictures too. Like this is, this is on top of the High Line looking north in the meatpacking district. And this is on the Brooklyn Bridge. So yeah, it definitely looks like photos from the 1800s because this is basically like 1800s technology. Um, but lensless photography is pretty, pretty cool because like if you look at like all the rivets on the Brooklyn Bridge, they're all sort of like in equal focus to each other um, because you are not making a decision about focus because you can't. Everything's kind of blurry, it's kind of out of focus. Um, but because of that, the light's coming in this like flat equal plane. So theoretically, the buildings in the background are the same amount focused as the stuff in the front. Um, a lens is basically what a lens does is it's forcing um, the incoming light to converge in a specific place. Um, so yeah, then everything else is out of focus. So I, um, I self-published that when I was, um, I was a creative resident in, for Adobe, um, which was not a residency, it was a fellowship, but anyway, uh, but yeah, then the MoMA republished it two years ago. So hopefully you'll see a lot of people looking super cool in public places while everyone else is using their smartphone. <laughs> So um, this project uh, is also another super literal title. <laughs> if anyone's trying to like title a murder mystery and you want to like give it all away, come talk to me. This is my <laughs> this is my true specialty in life. Um, yeah. So this one is called "This Book Is a Planetarium," and it's actually it's six different um, paper gadgets that ask this question of what can paper do, and it attempts to recreate. Um, different tech objects as simply as possible um, to get people asking questions about like why things work when there's nothing in there making it working. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna show you my trailer for that.
That was a big project. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was cool because, like, now people send me pictures of their kids and they're like, oh, you know, she won't go to sleep until she sees the planetarium on the ceiling. And I'm like, yes, we're making, like, a whole new generation of weird artist, designer, programmer, paper people. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's pretty much what I have. Um, but people sometimes ask me like where my inspiration comes from. And so um, I put together like this uh, New, York, New York Magazine approval matrix with uh, all my favorite lo-fi magic things. Um, so yeah, like whenever I have to think of a list of anything, it automatically goes into New York Magazine's approval matrix. But yeah, this one goes from transparent things. Like if you take these things apart, like a Vauvel, it will make sense. Um, all the way over to the what the fuck things where it's like I will never understand how a Mobius strip works. I've like read that Wikipedia article like 50 times. <laughs> I'm not going to get there. Um, yeah, but maybe maybe you all can ask me some questions because I probably went over. Sorry, Zach. Questions? Oh, thanks. <laughs> just, just one? OK, only only one question. <laughs> Stefan, I know you have a question. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stefan used to be my intern too, so like we go way back. <laughs> yeah. What are you working on next with the next book? Oh. Well, I've been, so this has been uh, like a very, a very long struggle, but I'm trying to get, I'm trying to make a pop-up book record player that works really super well, that isn't like flimsy and crappy and people are going to be disappointed by it, but more like something that like, you know, would be amazing. Um, I think I might have a video of it, actually. I can show you a really rough prototype. Is this it? This might be it. Oh yeah, this is it. Um, so this is a record with Conan O'Brien talking about Ted Nugent on it. I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, there's like the whole arm drop thing, which is fun. Ted Nugent's ranch. Well, he drove around on ATVs, uh, fired bows and arrows and trees, and then played catch scratch fever 600 times. <laughs> and then I bailed hay. It was the weird... Yeah, so it, it looks better than this now, but um, it took me really long to figure out like just how important the relationship between the needle and the groove was. And so I basically had to like, I talked to every record manufacturer in the US, they couldn't help me. Finally in Germany, I found someone who like, they make the needles and can make the record. And so um, basically, sorry, this is like way nerdy, but uh, needles are, are shaped like like this and so are record grooves and that they need to be shaped exactly the same way for there to be like full contact between the vibration um which is the only way that you get like sufficient clarity and amplification in like a non-electrical system so yeah it's taken me like five years to figure that out anyway i'm full of worthless knowledge so any anytime you all want trivia about uh, these things 
great. Cool. Thanks. We had a powwow in the back um, with the, the folks who brought Linux machines and have solved everything. So, um, And I think it was an elaborate plot to get me to install LibreOffice, which I'm really excited about. So, so um, now I would love to welcome Janice back. And I'm going to get, get all set up. So do you, you don't need sound? No. OK. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, you need the notes. So let's try system preferences, arrangement, not mirror, and then got it. An ADI, and then in there. Yay! Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. I don't know how this works. Um, yes. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Everybody, um, please give a warm welcome to Janice. Hello. Um, I'm Janice. I am a, um, a writer and researcher, um, and for the past um, around 10 years, I've been a journalist covering surveillance and privacy, um, and most recently, um, my work has kind of um, gone into sort of what happens to all of the data that's being collected through various sort of surveillance and data collection systems, and um, the obvious answer is machine learning happens. Um, and so this is a talk that I actually gave here um, about a year ago, an expanded and sort of like abridged version that's more up to date. Um, uh, having to do with um, the idea of human legibility to machines, um, the idea that human activity that was previously inscrutable or kind of useless to computer systems because they weren't um, sort of readable or understandable um, has now become readable and therefore has become exploitable um, for all types of purposes, including ones that we may not be super happy with. Um, and also that means that data that previously had what was seen to have be of limited value, like for example, posting photos on Facebook, it was just a photo, but what is actually happening, of course, when you post a photo on Facebook is that you are posting um, biometric information. And that is now something that can be easily extracted from the photo. And so therefore there's this new value that's been placed, that's been sort of like given to this data as a result of machine learning algorithms becoming um, as advanced as they are right now. Um, and basically um, what I've been focused on lately is sort of how um, the development of machine learning and AI um, has caused these systems to uh, allow people sort of like in positions of power to entrench um, asymmetric power relationships that exist already um, by enabling governments and corporations to manipulate and control information and therefore people. So um, so this is a quote from, so Shoshana Zuboff is a for, uh, professor emeritus at Harvard um, Business School and actually I believe has a, a book out um, either now or soon um, about um, this term which she called that which she coined called surveillance capitalism and this is a quote um, that I like to bring up whenever people start saying that line about how like you know oh well we don't want the government to have all this data but it's okay if like Facebook and Google have it because they can't hurt me and so this is kind of like a very um, this is like what the quote that I always bring up in response and it's basically a, a an anonymous data scientist at an unnamed uh, Silicon Valley company saying, the goal of everything we do is to change people's actual behavior at scale. When people use our app, we can capture their behaviors, identify good and bad behaviors, 
and develop ways to reward the good and punish the bad. We can test how actionable our cues are for them and how profitable for us. So this is kind of like a refutation of that idea that like there is nothing sort of harmful potentially going on and we'll get more into like the different ways in which that is so. Um, and so surveillance capitalism is this term again coined by Shoshana Zuboff and she describes it as an emergent logic of accumulation uh, in the networked sphere constituted by unexpected and often illegible mechanisms of extraction, commodification, and control that effectively exile persons from their own behavior while producing new markets of behavioral prediction and modification. So um, in turn, when we're saying illegible, um, we're talking about things like hidden trackers that are in websites that record sort of your mouse movements and like how long you stay on a page and um, also like black box algorithms, like algorithms where the sort of like way in which they function is not made clear uh, a lot of times intentionally. Um, and prediction modification is kind of like, you know, we've heard the term fake news used in various by various people in various ways, um, but it essentially can be boiled down to as a form of propaganda and therefore control of information. And this is kind of like, you know, when we if we live in a world where people's behaviors are easily readable and therefore um, susceptible to processes like machine learning algorithms that can predict behavior, um, what's called a pattern of life is the term that the military uses for when they um, track people's movements um, on, on a battlefield and then use that data to predict where they're going to be at certain times, that becomes actionable. Um, oops. Um, so when we talk about unintentional data emissions, we're talking about a lot of different things. Here's just a couple of examples. So loc geolocation data, which is like cell site data, um, you know, whenever you um, are using a cell phone and connected to the cell phone network, um, it has to connect to a tower that's nearby. And that gives that necessarily just because of the way that the cell network was built, um, transmits information, identifying information about your device to the nearby cell phone tower. Um, and, you know, GPS, Wi-Fi, triangulation, Bluetooth are all sort of like proximity-oriented um, technology that um, allows for this kind of information to sort of be used. Um, phone records, if you remember like the Edward Snowden, like the 215 program that was revealed by like one of his like sort of first revelations, that's what's being collected under that program is basically records of who you called, when, and for how long, which is what we call metadata which is not data, like content data, but data about the data. Um, web history is what site you visited and for how long. Search history is what you search for, including like, you know, if you like say, Alexa, order me toilet paper, like obviously that is, you know, recorded. And then um, same thing goes with mobile devices. And then um, web interaction patterns is something that has kind of been um, for a while was kind of the limitations of like how you could track people's behavior on websites, which was like, you know, how long people hover over certain parts of the page, um, what they click on, how long, how like the sort of like um, rhythm of like how they scroll through the page. All of these are things which can, which are um, regularly recorded on a lot of websites that track um, user behavior through ad networks and other things. Um, and so, and then of course, um, things like Pokemon Go are obviously. So Pokemon Go was actually originally. Um, it's ba it was essentially a in its original form was basically a reskin of a Google um, app called Ingress, which was um, created for the purpose of, and this is like stated by Google, um, of analyzing pedestrian walking patterns. Um, and so this is kind of like a way of collecting more kind of data on um, the movement of pedestrians throughout physical space. Um, and so. When we talk about machine learning, uh, machine learning and predictive algorithms, some of you may be familiar with this as a result of having of being here. Um, but so this is kind of like a kind of like a very sort of like dumbed down example of um, what uh, convolutional neural networks, which is a form of machine learning algorithm. Um, basically, what happens is that um, a predictive model is created. So like a model of like the way things. Uh, are going to be interpreted are to in order to achieve a specific ta task like identify faces, identify whether this object belongs into this group of objects or this group of objects, um, and then uh, collect raw material in the form of example data. So this is like when you talk about machine learning, this is the actual learning part is when you take example data, feed it into the system to give it examples of like this belongs in this group and this belongs in this group, and then eventually gets a better sense of that. And then fine tune by adjusting parameters and um, um, that basically allows the sort of system to match new input that's not in the data 
data set with sort of pre-learned classes of what it understands these pre-learned classes of objects to be, um, and then assign what's called a confidence score, which is basically like, I am 90, You've probably seen those things where it shows like there was a really great one recently where um, there's actually like a way of disrupting um, uh, using adversarial examples. There's a way of disrupting um, algorithms ability to like successfully match to their classes. And there was like this picture of a cat and a and a guacamole and it couldn't it said that the guacamole was a cat and because it was fed this adversarial example. Um, and so um, when we talk about machine readable um, human beings, um, here's just a couple examples that, of that. Face recognition obviously is like a huge topic. Um, emotion recognition, there are, there are um, companies like Affectiva who um, have sort of developed ways to track facial expressions, um, both voluntary and involuntary, uh, to measure mood and emotional response in real time. Gate detection, which is kind of like the sort of pattern of your walking. Um, which can be flagged based on, you know, if you remember the term like furtive movements, which is used by police to like justify killing people a lot, that is that is essentially like a form of gate detection. Is like 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 I'm imagining sort of like an algorithm flagging people for like moving in a certain way, which is potentially really dangerous. Um, speech recognition, um, speaking patterns, and being able to be transcribed, like you know, on a lot of phones, they can you can like speak into it and it'll like type the text out. Um, Personal biometrics, which is like kind of like vitals, like heart rate, skin conductance, like most smartphones at this point have like sort of like health apps that allow you to track these things. And then body kinematics, which is like, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, body kinematics is actually probably more in, in the realm of um, the sort of furtive movement example. Um, gate detection is more of like the sort of like pacing of steps, like as you're walking through space. Um, and um, so this this GIF here is like from it's from Ghost in the Shell, and I actually really um, I really am fascinated with this scene because it's basically this like computer operator who has cybernetic hands so that he can type really fast, um, which is like kind of interesting to me because like this is like a movie that came out in like 1998, and at the time I guess we thought that the way that we would interact better with computers is that we would get giant cyber hands and we would be able to type really fast, but what actually has happened, which now seems like a bit more obvious, is that computers have become better at reading human beings and the ways that our faces move, the ways that our bodies move, et cetera. Um, so um, this is like one example in the wild, um, a, an advertisement in Oslo, Norway, um, for a pizza restaurant. Um, and basically this person on Reddit, I think, found um, that this crashed, this this uh, the screen crashed, like the advertisement crashed, and revealed all this code, basically showing that there was a hidden camera that was detecting people um, as they walked by, and basically uh, determining, trying to, or at least determine their age, their gender, their attention time, which is sort of the time that they, that it thinks the eyes have sort of moved to be looking at the screen. Um, and interestingly, it show it the ad changed depending on whether it thought you were a man or a woman. If you were a man, it would show you an ad for pizza, and if you if it thought you were a woman, it would show you a salad. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, so, and then. Um, Getting into sort of like obviously like law enforcement uses of these these things are are very prominent now. Um, this is an article that I wrote around the time that um, uh, basically uh, Taser, the company best known for you know making stun guns, um, decided to get into the AI business and basically rebranded itself as an AI company. And they started revealing plans for a system that basically can identify people and objects through police body cameras, those wonderful things that we thought would like bring accountability to police, um, which, you know, of course, perhaps obviously um, are sort of now being used to um, create more sort of readable data from the actual cameras themselves from police like on the street. Um, and like the way that they pitched this um, project was kind of like as like an outward brain that kind of increases it ineffectively increases like the power of individual cops like you know being able to like sort of like look at someone and like you know do face recognition instantaneously bring up information about them whether they like got a parking ticket the other week or you know stuff like that um and now you know so instead of just getting a ticket for hopping a turnstile cops you know the idea with the system is that cops can have instant instant access to all these data points um that can be used to justify further enfor enforcement action 
Um, and this goes with like emotion recognition. Um, and of course, this is not deployed widely yet, but it's like something that I've been looking out for because it seems rather obvious that this is sort of like what they're trying to do. And you know, the result here is that interactions with police become more dangerous. Um, and so these are a couple of other examples like Taylor Swift's security using facial recognition um, to sort of prow like prowl the crowd and find a person who was stalking Taylor Swift. And um, apparently in China, they actually did arrest someone using this pop concert that um, this pop star concert that someone showed up to and then like, you know, they were scanning the crowd with face recognition and were able to catch this person um, sort of in the crowd. Um, and then, yeah, and then, you know, obviously, like, the way that we should think about this is um, being able to identify and remove people with, like, criminal arrest records, being able to harass uh, marginalized people um, for additional surveillance. You know, all of this is sort of just, it's just a use case change. Like, there doesn't need to be anything really done to this technology aside from changing the field names and changing the, like, the use case. This is basically can, you know, helping. Uh, and actually, there was this recent report I noted down that, um, ICE um, is getting uh, license plate, plate reader data from local police departments in 23 states now. So license plate reader data being like when you pass through a toll bridge or something, it like captures your license plate. Um, so that's like being shared with ICE to do things that ICE does. Um, so this is very, very real in terms of like its potential of being used in this way. Um, and then, of course, uh, predictive policing, like PredPol, are, there's various systems that um, do these things uh, that sort of try to create hotspots, like heat, heat maps, as they're called, to sort of map out um, areas where crimes might occur. But of course, what's happening is that the, the, um, uh, there's a huge amount of bias introduced because the areas where they have the most data are the areas where cops are showing up the most. So obviously, it creates this kind of feedback loop where communities of color, immigrants, um, all of these people who are normally policed the most are then subjected to additional policing. And um, uh, this was um, kind of in that same vein, um, Amazon doorbell system, um, they, they announced that there's kind of like, uh, there's this like, sort of like flagging system for like when suspicious people were detecting and there's they have this thing called ring which actually has this kind of like neighborhood watch app enabled to it um which which is terrible terrible idea there's literally never been a neighborhood watch in the history of time that has not been racist um so like basically this enables that to sort of be operationalized and like you think about i think what her name was like like barbecue becky who was like the the sort of character who was like you know like just snitching like just just like not nothing was going on but of course like this like sort of in almost like thinking about like the ways that systems like this encourage certain behaviors and discourage other behaviors um and perhaps produce more negative outcomes um and so this is like so this is like an anime series uh that's not super great um it's called psychopath but it like kind of was what got me thinking in this direction and basically in this in this anime series like there's a super advanced ai system and it like has the ability to sort of just like look at anyone and determine like what their probability of committing a crime is and if it's too high then it like allows you to like like the, the gun unlocks and then you can stun them if it's like way too high then it allows you to just kill them on the spot and like this is like kind of a terrifying thing like sort of like if we imagine sort of taking these things to their logical conclusions um and so like the point that i try to make to people is basically is that the idea that like when you automate a system when you create automation you're enforcing ideology systemically you're creating essentially like computational ideology um historically when systems of law fail us, we go outside of the law and we build something new and it becomes harder um, it becomes harder or maybe impossible to sort of subvert the rules if the rules are unjust and they're sort of hard coded into the technology that organizes um, our daily lives. And so that's kind of the danger, the sort of overall danger here. And so like, you know, thinking about what is the ideological system that is being sort of imposed by these various examples that I've given you. Like, is it fully automated luxury space communism or is it fully automated misogynist earth fascism? Um, anyway, um, so so this is an article um, that I wrote recently actually for Dazed Magazine um, as part of a 
um, sort of um, an issue that was guest edited by Chelsea Manning. And um, I wrote about um, machine learning algorithms uh, and specifically started out by focusing on gender recognition, um, the idea of gender recognition, um, and um, basically how these kind of like systems have negative impacts on queer and trans people. And so, um, you know, obviously for gender recognition, um, what's happening is essentially is that it's this enforcing, like per, per ideology, a, a, this false belief that gender is binary, that it's unchangeable, that it cannot, can only be determined by looking at someone by a person's physical characteristics. Of course, this is false. It's been proven false by science. Um, there's plenty of scientific research that shows that gender is you know, determine, is not determined by a person's physical body or biological sex, which is the term that they use now. Um, and it kind of, you know, is scary in that it kind of is reminiscent of this, the memo that the Trump administration came out with last year, which effectively said exactly this, which is that, you know, um, a person's gender listed on their birth certificate or whatever is either male or female, immutable and determined by the sex assigned to them at birth, which is, of course, not true. But if there is a system that's enforcing it that way, then it kind of doesn't matter what the truth is. It just matters what the model that has been put into the system is. Um, and so um, this is another example that I mentioned in that article, which is that um, basically, so um, there's a genre of YouTube uh, videos called sort of transition timeline videos, and they're pretty important to the trans community because they sort of like involve a person who takes like a photo of themselves like every day as they go through hormone therapy. And you can see sort of like subtly at first, but then eventually these very, very like dramatic changes that happen as a result of hormone therapy. Um, and so, and this is kind of used as something that's very validating to, to trans people. It's like something that when people who are like, maybe like wonder, like, you know, doubting that like, well, this, maybe this won't work for me. And then like seeing other people go through this process before you embark on it yourself is really empowering. Um, but this is an example of, so there was this, um, these researchers at uh, University of North Carolina who basically tried to tackle what they described as a problem of face recognition algorithms not being able to identify someone after they transition with hormone therapy. Um, and so it's called the HRT transgender data set. Uh, interestingly, um, so Adam Harvey, the artist Adam Harvey, who some of you may know, uh, originally brought this to my attention. And actually, mysteriously, this data set has disappeared now. So it's not available anymore. Um, there was a bunch of attention brought to, like, and criticism brought to these researchers at the time. Um, but basically, the idea is that all of these transition timeline videos were taken without the permission of the people who created them. And, um, you know, as a result, you know, they, they kind of just like were being used in a way that they weren't intended for. And like, you know, the kind of entire framing of this study is that, you know, there's this problem that exists because trans people can't be identified like after they transition, which is like a funny way of putting it because like trans people are not a problem for you to solve, like we're people. Um, so it's like the whole framing of this kind of study was very worrying. And so here's a quote from the the article um, that I wrote. Um, and so basically the justification for this, um, one of the justifications that was given for this research was that um, the guy, there's this hypothetical scenario that they say in the white paper where they say, well, what if a terrorist goes on hormones and then bypasses a border checkpoint, which is ridiculous, of course, because of like, if you had bothered to ask even a single trans person, you would know that nobody in their right mind would ever do that because it would be, tra it would be traumatic, first of all, to a cis person to like change their body in a way that is not conforming with their gender. Um, and this is, you know, this is the whole point that so many trans folks transition is that they don't want to be identified by how their face or their body looked before transitioning. Um, and so that's, this is kind of a line from, um, uh, from the article that I wrote basically, you know, saying that, you know, this is what, this is like completely, you know, if this, if these researchers had even thought to like ask any trans people what they thought of the study, it would have you know, maybe not even happened. It was just very obvious. Um, and then um, here's another example that I mentioned in, in that same article is these, this sort of gaydar, crim, um, much in the way of this sort of like criminal, like detecting whether somebody's a criminal. Um, this goes back into sort of like, you know, these sort of like disproven pseudoscience, like physiognomy and phrenology, which are basically like this, these old um, sort of like um, long disproven um, sort of pseudosciences that, claim that people's like sort of like 
behaviors can be sort of like you know predicted based on like their the measurements of their head and the, their face um and this is basically just you know phrenology dressed up in a machine learning suit um and the same thing happened with the study where basically they claimed that they could figure out if someone was gay um which is the whole concept of that is kind of crazy because once again if you know gender is not based on looks and like if attraction is based on visual attraction and a person's physical physical appearance doesn't con doesn't necessarily conform to the gender that they are then like what does that even mean like what does gay mean um so once again just like creating a frame of reality that is based on sort of like very um cis and like hetero interpretations of what being gay is and so the quote that i put here is you know without intervention a society that historically benefits from white supremacy patriarchy and harmful assumptions about gender and sexuality will produce technology that enshrines those values and so these are the models are kind of ideologies that are being imposed on us and so the questions here is are that that i always encourage people who are working with machine learning to ask is what values is your system asserting what assumptions are being made in your system who may be harmed were they involved in the process and maybe you should maybe if like you can't answer these questions maybe don't make it like that's always an option um i know that's not a very popular option in the world of like sort of technology sort of like like large sort of like more large moneyed corporations that like always have to be building something but sometimes it's better to like if the harm is greater than the potential harm is greater than the value then it probably maybe should consider that um and so this is basically from an adapted term that um, my friend Caroline Sinders came up with this um, this term called emotional malware to describe um, uh, to describe like fake news and the fake news phenomenon. And I kind of adopted it into this other kind of term called which I, I called psychological malware, which is a form of networked psychological warfare that exploits the increased machine readability of humans. And so like all of the behavioral data that I was talking about before, this is like basically operationalizing that in order to predict. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether like so in some cases it may not be an accurate prediction in others, maybe in the future, maybe it will be. Um, and so, you know, or the other definition being an automated processor system that utilizes large data sets of human activity in order to predict and modify the future behavior of individuals or populations. Um, so one prominent example of this, of course, is Facebook. Um, this is kind of a was a huge news story at the time. This was like one of the sort of earlier Facebook scandals among like we're now up to like 500 million. Um, but Facebook basically did this study um, that um, where they um, started showing without any consent, they started showing different timelines to different people, some with negative content and some with positive content to see if people as a result of seeing more negative or more positive things would post more negative or more positive things. Um, it turns out um, they were right. Um, people did actually, it was actually pretty easy to get to modify people's behavior in this way just by affecting what they see. And it was this huge scandal and Mark Zuckerberg is very sorry, TM. Um, and so this obviously, the this is only like a year, and this is like around the time that I started getting really interested in um, this topic and then t like about a year or two later um the 2016 election cambridge analytica was this huge this company that was basically found to be doing these what they called psychographic profiles developed from uh data that was taken that was taken from quizzes that people had done um on facebook and basically um by using this quiz data they were able to find out who, which people were more suggest suggestible to um like trump campaign ads and sort of hyper target people in this way. Um, and that, you know, this was like kind of the public's realization that basically all they're doing is realizing that Facebook business model is using that same data to access, to get access to people's like, you know, behavioral in the same way. And so why not use it for this thing? Um, and so like breaking down sort of the different components here, um, so like when you have a system of mass surveillance, when you have data collection just sort of happening as a matter of course, and you have um, the ability through machine learning algorithms for uh, humans to become more machine readable, and you have a system which effectively exploits that gathered behavior, um, we start like wondering like, what are the possibilities around like governments using this as a form of social control um if the, like cambridge analytica was able to sort of like take these very you know few data points from people's 
um, Facebook quizzes and then use that to sort of determine like what, whether people are more susceptible to messages than like, you know, other things um, probably are also possible. Um, so conclusions, um, human bodies and, and emotions are increasingly machine readable. Machine readability allows human emotional manipulation and automated enforcement of pre-existing oppressive structures. Um, maybe we should stop asking, like, how can this be made ethically sometimes and start asking, like, why should this exist? Um, the leg and, you know, the sort of point of we're enforcing these ideological systems and some a lot of times if we're not involving people who are directly in fact affected by the systems that are being built then we're sort of just advancing you know this sort of default state of a sort of white supremacist imperialist this hetero patriarchal society um and we have to assume that if we don't intervene in some way um by like either you know diversity initiatives, other, you know, things to get people who are actually affected in making these decisions, then we wind up just reproducing those things in our technology. Um, so, and the last point being, you know, machine learning is intersectional or it's bullshit. So, which is basically kind of the summary of like, why, you know, when people ask why are, why is diversity in tech important? Why is like, you know, is it, why is it important to have people who are actually from the affected groups um, or potentially affected groups involved in these processes? And the question, the answer is everything that just came before is that like, this is what happens when you don't have those people involved. And so that's about it. And there's my contact and stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I can take questions if anyone has them. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you could speak maybe to the example of China, because it sounds like the computer system is so difficult and seems to be a very good indication of what is happening there, mm -hmm. especially with a you group know, like white supremacy and Hong Kong embassy. Uh, can you speak to yeah. this, this confirmed everything we've been talking about? <laughs> or is there like anything surprising or novel about their implementation and uh, the way they yeah, no, totally. That's a great that's a great point. Um, yeah, so in China, um, there is a kind of social credit system called Sesame Credit, which is effectively um, this kind of like algorithmic system that draws data from like, you know, financial records, like all kinds of things and, and um, kind of like establishes a kind of social credit score. Um, and this is kind of a way of, you know, what like we've been seeing little sort of bits of this in the US as well, where, you know, you'll see like health insurance companies that will sort of like use social media posts in order to determine like that you are at risk of some thing and therefore deny you coverage or raise your premium and do stuff like that. So there is an actual system in China that kind of has like the exact same intention. Um, and that is that is kind of, yeah, like, like you're saying, like um, enforcing this kind of like, um, idea that like people need to be worthy in order to receive healthcare, in order to like participate in society in various ways, um, creating this kind of like um, gateway into that sort of creates all these really um, terrifying scenarios where um, you can start, there's, there's, you know, a way of sort of like justifying, denying people things that they need um, because of sort of like an algorithm that just determines like, oh, you're not credit worthy and you, you, you're, you posted about smoking weed last week on social media and so therefore like we're you're we're going to raise your rates or whatever um so yeah does that answer your question okay cool what else mm -hmm. um yeah uh, when, when you make the connection in the first talk where there was people that looked like this in the world mm -hmm. and then you think it's a new approach of companies to try to, to show the good side of them of how much they are injured while still keeping the maybe dirty work for us that we don't want to do for them. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that all large corporations like have potential for doing great things like the things that we saw earlier um i don't necessarily think that's like a way of covering it up so much as it's saying that the point being that you know these things we need to be like mindful of like when we create technology especially in the fields of machine learning um that you know we sort of anticipate potential misuses as well as the intended uses um because 
that is kind of what happens. And I think that a lot of um, a lot of companies like Google and Facebook, they, de they they'll develop things that are used in one way, but you know, like me and maybe like my other sort of like more paranoid cohort will always be like, oh, well, obviously that can be used by police to do such and such and whatever. Um, but it's not obvious to people who are, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's less obvious to people who are making like big salaries and like basically paid to just push products out. And so like the sort of, there's this drive to, um, especially in like the world of like Silicon Valley, sort of like startup tech to sort of just like get the product out, like just move it um, and get it to completion. And this is something that kind of maybe gets lost a lot of times in, in doing so. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, it's, I mean, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm always like, like, I'm like a problems gal. I'm not really a solutions gal. Um, I like to, <laughs> I, I think that there, I think that there are definitely some things that are like positive developments in these areas, like, you know, um, working out like ways that we can sort of subvert these things are obviously like one method, um, which may or may not be effective in the long term. Like I mentioned before, adversarial examples, which is um, a um, basically like there's a, a lot of papers on this and it's actually a really fascinating topic if you ever want to look up uh, universal adversarial perturbations, which are basically like adversarial examples that are introduced to the data set, which um, allow the machine learning system to not be able to correctly recognize things um, as what they are as what we recognize them as humans um and that is kind of you know but a lot of a lot in a lot of cases that's kind of just like it's kind of a cat and mouse game because you introduce adversarial examples and then adversarial examples start becoming part of the data set and then they train for adversarial examples and then the whole thing sort of repeats over and over again um i think that the more robust solutions have to become sort of like structurally um because like i think this is less this is not precisely like a technology solution to like, I don't think there has to be only a technology solution to a technology problem because the problem is structural. The problem is structural and it's societal. And I think that like doing, approaching those problems on every level and not just on the technology level has to be what approach we take. We were um, having oh. a similar this kind of space, right? Like to start conversations and to organize and to make sure that these types of conversations can be had. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah, no, for sure. I definitely think like having like programs like this, for example, um, are really great. And um, I always encourage people to like um, start thinking about like potential implications when they start building things. And especially if you're just starting to be a person that builds things, I think it's really important to think about. Um, can I, he was yeah, like, um, I was kind of along, uh, actually along those lines of sort of, do you think it's more effective to oppose the misuse of the, the data about ourselves and the sort of data destruction of data, or do you do like data analysis and, and use it? Um, because you know, obviously there's all the lot out there about the things that can be done or about, I think there's some control over maybe not the Mm -hmm. How much can that be effective versus actually from a decision making control autonomy? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so things like things like GDPR are obviously like that's like the sort of the legal approach. Like you some you create something in the law that like allows you to have some ownership of your data and gives you some kind of autonomy over that. I think I mean, I guess it's all a matter of preference and like I you know I like I believe in a diversity of tactics, so I always like to sort of include that as one way of going about it. I think that one, any one method is probably insufficient. It needs to happen on all fronts simultaneously. So like we need to be making the algorithms that disrupt 
computer vision. We need to be like trying to push for like legal rights over data and like legal rights over sort of like digital personhood almost like, you know, you see stuff like um, like deep fakes, which are these sort of like algorithmically created um, sort of like porn videos where people's faces are basically pasted onto porn models and like the, the usage of someone else's image and like in a really convincing way to make them like say and do things that they wouldn't otherwise say and do, I think is like an interesting um, angle of approach for if you were going to legislate this to basically say like, you know, using an image in this way is like you have control over that because you are the person that's being represented here and changing the way that we think about like data that's infinitely reproduced, um, that's personal data, that's biometric data, that's like, um, I think is one, yeah, one way of going about it. Thank you. So um, our next uh, speaker, Surya Matu, is um, he's he's one of the uh, sweetest people I know. Um, he is the um, we have a, we're in a shared studio space together, and he's the person who collects the rent checks. And he's like he always gives this really great smile. You can see him in the back smiling now. Um, he's a, da uh, a data scientist and an artist and uh, a journalist and um, I'm always seeing crazy projects that he works on. I think the last time I was reading a story about some, you know, it was like people on a boat behind Mar-a-Lago finding the Wi-Fi was unencrypted. And like, I'm like reading this really interesting article about these hackers, like, you know, doing this crazy shit. And there was Surya in the boat, um, so probably smiling. So um, let's welcome Surya. We might debug Linux a little bit and yeah, welcome. <laughs> And while Surya is um, getting set up, uh, just want to remind you, Lauren mentioned it, but on Wednesday, next Wednesday, we have an event where you can meet the incoming students from SFBC. So I encourage you to come back um, and uh, get to know people. All right, it's, it's open here. Okay. No, we like open source. It's just, yeah, I don't know. We always, yeah, you just have to recompile your kernel. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. It's fine. All right. Uh, are you okay just uh, mirrored or do you need uh, notes? Present notes would be preferable. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think it's fine. Let's try it. Let's try. Um, notes. Oh, wait. Oh, you didn't, I don't think you mirrored. Oh, no. Oh, wait. I. But I am, I'm not mirrored. You're not mirrored. But huh. I, think, I think you just need to get out of this. What do I need to do? Present. Sorry. Present. Present. Oh, I mean, wait. Hang on. Okay, Let's sorry. Run this down. Sorry, I do not know. That. Neither do I. We're figuring it out. <laughs> we could do it. We're technologists. Yeah. I and I think that. Um, so this is it. Normally does like. Hang on. You just said uh, open in slides. Wait, did you do? Wait, hang on. Let's do it one more way. I think you need to present with. Your. Now this, so this is mine, and that needs to go on the other side. On the other window. Yeah, so okay. There. And then we full screen this. Yeah. And I and if you if you adjust here, it adjusts there. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. great. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Everybody, Syria. Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you all for having the patience to wait. I'm gonna try to go through this really fast and let you ask questions and move on because it's late and you're probably all wasted and want to go to home and go to bed and um, I'll just try to get through my stuff really quick. So hi, I'm Surya, nice to meet all of you. Hopefully I'll meet you after this. I'm an artist, engineer, and accidental journalist. Um, I will kind of go through in this presentation the kind of work I do, how I got there, and uh, what I've sort of learned from it. Um, so to start off, I currently work at this place called The Markup. Uh, I work, my official title is investigative, investigative data journalist. 
Shout out to Maddie Varna, who is in, a fellow investigative data journalist at the markup with me. Um, this is a uh, journalism organization started by Julia Angwin, Sue Gardner, and Jeff Larson. I used to work with Julia and Jeff Larson at ProPublica, and we did a series there called Machine Bias that was focused on understanding the harms that algorithmic systems cause to society. So kind of the biggest story we did with the same name of the series was, um, was this one, it's called Machine Bias. And we basically looked at this um, algorithmic system called um, Compass. It was a risk assessment tool being used in the criminal justice system. And we looked at uh, Broward County in Florida. And over there, we managed to get, so basically they in, in Broward County, Florida, they implemented a system that based on a 134 question questionnaire, the way you answered it, it would give you a score from one to 10 of the likelihood of you committing a crime again. And we did a FOIA request on the data of this algorithm and the way it was actually affecting people who were having to give these tests. And we found, surprise, surprise, that it was um, basically, it was twice as likely to say African-Americans would, would get a high score and they wouldn't commit a crime again. And similarly, Caucasians would get, were twice as likely to get a low score and not commit a crime again, uh, and, and commit a crime. And basically what that kind of means is that the way the system works, right, it was based on a data set on what was trained or what criminality looks like. And it didn't really take into account the fact that criminality actually is like based on the people who decide what a criminal looks like and who a criminal is, right? Like, so there was just more data showing how people of color were criminals because people, people of color were arrested more often than Caucasians. And this kind of also skewed based on uh, neighborhoods and socioeconomic statuses. But I'm kind of not going to go into this in detail. I just want to show you this because you might have come across it. And this is kind of work we're trying to do with the markup and we're kind of looking at like how do algorithmic systems and automated decision-making processes affect people and more, more importantly, marginalized communities and the way they harm them. But really just to like step back from my a personal experience, I have a background in engineering and I used to work for a medical engineering company. And the thing that was kind of really, that's been funny for me is when I worked for this medical engineering company, we made microchips that people use to detect heart rates, right? So like in hospitals, if you've ever got that like thing that you put in your finger that determines your heart rate, that's the thing my company used to make. And to make that thing, it was a pretty simple te technological algorithm that we used, but it was a pain in the ass to get that product out into the market because there was so much regulation. There was so much stuff that kind of went into how the system is going to work in society and what the impacts of it are going to be in a space like a hospital, right? So I kind of came into the world of technology with the assumption that people are really thinking hard about the kind of context and implications of technology on society, right? And it turns out with data, that's just like not true. <laughs> like, this is like completely not true. Like as, as an engineer, when we used to do this stuff, like they used to like, some of you are gonna learn how to code now and you're gonna learn about variables and they're gonna learn about unassigned variables if you do JavaScript, you're not, but if you do C++, <laughs> you are. But what you're going to learn is that, like, that these things that you can kind of, these, things, these code programs that you can write, and like the way you write them really matter, right? So like when we wrote these like heart rate monitors, they would like make sure, they would like have these like linting programs that would make sure that everything worked exactly like you said it was going to work, right? Like that's how a lot of like engineering used to be done. But with the data-driven like kind of society we live in now, we seem to have forgotten this really kind of simple fact. And the way, so I work as a journalist now, and the way, like, I think I have two slides that kind of prove holistically how this works in present day. First is, people raise the question of the impact of technology in society and the way in which it may be harming it. And companies who are possibly kind of implicated in these in these problems will deny that there's any relationship between them and the situation and then when there's proof that there was actually there was actually an implication they'll just deny it and say oh we're sorry we didn't mean to cause that harm right like this is these two slides you can say this about almost any tech company in the last like five years right and the common thing you hear from people who work in the tech industry is that they didn't intend to cause any harm the reasons data-driven systems are prejudiced is that the data their systems are learning from reflect, reflect those prejudices. So the question becomes, who is responsible for ensuring that these prejudices don't get encoded into the technical systems that are supposed to make our lives easier? The reality is that unless you explicitly state the values that technology has, they will imbue the values of the culture they're made in. 
So as Jan has said, that if you don't have a diverse group of people making the technology, kind of raising the questions of the problems that might come up, you will encode those and embed those in your classifiers, in your models, in your CSV files. Like it's going to be there unless you look to ask the questions. So that's a lot of really heavy stuff. And I, I am happy to talk to all of you about it in more in detail personally. But what I want to talk to you now, especially those who are like starting SFPC, is the is the kind of the value of craft, right? So all this stuff that I'm going to talk about from now on is based on a craft I learned that I was super into which is packet sniffing, right? Does everyone here know what I mean by packet sniffing? Does anyone not know what I mean by packet sniffing? So packet sniffing is when you look at network traffic going through your, your, your like Wi-Fi, your, your computer, looking at the network activity of the kind of computational devices you have lying around. I'm sorry that the slide has a pig snout. It's just that like the slide of the nose looks like men's genitals. <laughs> and it's easier to have that to like, and to reflect the point. But basically what it is, is it's just like you're looking at data going through network traffic and trying to tell stories from that. So I, when I, when I kind of got started off, I was like super into packet sniffing. I thought it was the coolest thing. And when I got into it, I was also convinced that like every story that was interesting about packet sniffing had already been done. Right, so like I really like this thing, it's really cool, I do not see the value in it. And I'm gonna now show you three stories that I've done, or three projects that I've done that are related to that. And really for the students, I'm, I'm showing this to you from the context of like, whatever you're like really into, just go for it because it'll make sense in hindsight. It won't make sense when you're doing it, but it will make sense in hindsight. So the first project is this project called From the Dark. And this was my actually my thesis at ITP where I was a student, which was at NYU. And I got really interested in this. In 2014, the Snowden documents had just come out, and I was super interested in Wi-Fi. And the reason I was interested in Wi-Fi was there were a lot of these companies like Euclid Analytics and a bunch of others who basically said that they're going to provide in-store targeted advertising for, uh, for brick and mortar stores the way you kind of have them in a browser. So the argument was that we, we, we will give you these like devices, these Wi-Fi routers, and if you install them, along with providing the internet connection, we're also, they're also going to give us all this like kind of fingerprinting data to help you understand who's coming through your stores and what they kind of do. And I was like, hmm, that sounds kind of gross. And obviously in their like terms of service and their conditions, like we don't collect any data that's like personally identifiable. It's just like Wi-Fi data and all of this stuff. But who here has had the experience of going home and having their phone automatically connect to their Wi-Fi network? Right, so the way that happens is that the Wi-Fi protocol was originally designed to make it super easy for you to reconnect to networks you've always been already been to. The way it used to do that, it's changed a little now, but basically the way it used to do that is it would have a list of all the networks you've ever connected to and just broadcast those network names when you weren't connected to a network. Right, so like it was like, if I, for me, it would be like, NYU, are you around the markup? Are you around? My phone was constantly just broadcasting every place I'd been to. And this is kind of an interesting point because when the 802.11 protocol, which is what Wi-Fi's like technical name is, was made, the reason they did this was BlackBerry sucked. Their Wi-Fi hardware was really shitty and CEOs would get really pissed off that their Wi-Fi didn't work well. So they would say, hey, why doesn't this work well? And they made this super aggressive kind of protocol to make sure it would reconnect. They didn't think about the fact that when Wi-Fi became ubiquitous, each Wi-Fi network name would become a fingerprint about someone's life, right? Knowing whether someone's been to NYU or Columbia or all the places they've been to, it becomes this like fingerprint about them that you really can't, you really wouldn't know otherwise. So anyway, when I was in ITP, I was sniffing all these packets for people and I built these Wi-Fi portraits for them, right? And it was this really kind of interesting thing when I, I would go up to someone and I talk to them and say, yo, I've been like looking into the Wi-Fi stack and it turns out there's like super crazy vulnerability where our phones is like broadcasting unencrypted all the networks you've been to. But yeah, cool, whatever, like brown hacker bro dude, I don't really care. Like anyway, here's your data, right? And I showed them their list and they'd be like, what? How do you do that? And I'd be like, I just told you. <laughs> and, like, and like that pattern would repeat itself again and again. And I realized that till you can like make the story of data personal and interactive and something that's meaningful to the person who's experiencing it, it's kind of garbage, it's kind of arbitrary, it's, it's, it doesn't really kind of make an impact. So anyway, what I learned from this Wi-Fi project was that it's actually really hard to do this. I got super lucky as this being my first experiment 
where I could explain kind of casually how a protocol works, show someone their data through that protocol, and then also tell them what they have to do to prevent it, which is like just turn off the Wi-Fi button on your phone. Um, I've never been able to have it that good, and I'm still like trying, but, but like, that's like a different story. But the next project I want to show you is a project called Herbivore, which kind of came out of, out of uh, the Wi-Fi project. So I kind of was like, okay, I'm really interested in giving people agency around the network traffic, right? I really want them to have a better understanding of how these devices we have, what they look like, what they kind of smell like. I really like this idea of like, it doesn't matter if you can't fully understand all the details of the protocols, but you should be able to like look at a device and be like, mm, is that stinky or is that okay, right? Like there's like some like kind of like basic metric that should be able that you should be able to have. And normally when you look at like network traffic analysis tools like Wireshark, they look like this, right? And like, yeah, exactly, all the snickers, anyone who's looked at this like knows that this doesn't mean anything, right? Like this is only useful for a very specific audience of like IT administrators and network admins who are trying to do very specific annoying things. So what we tried to do with Herbivore was make a much simpler version of that, right? So we tried to, it's like, this is super crude, this is me and Jen Kagan just like trying to like hack together a project and an idea and it, like, it shows you like what was happening on your on your home network. It annotated that with some in other information about like public IP versus private IP and kind of give it, it was designed to be like a tool to help you figure out what was like, what like what an architecture of a computer networks looks like and how does that kind of relate to your personal life. The other thing Herbivore does is it lets you look at network traffic. It does like, it does packet sniffing. And it lets you look at the network traffic going through your computer that's running Herbivore, but it also lets you look at the network traffic of any other device connected to your home network. So any other devices that are on this network, Herbivore can help you look at the traffic of, right? And what that kind of looks like is this, right? So, it's, uh, what? Quest access. Let's see if I can do this super fast. I don't know. Let's see. I need permission. Request access. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's not hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try. All right. I'm gonna do this three times. We have three videos. Open share settings. Why does it, if I gave you access to the slides, why doesn't it? I don't know. Technology. Maybe it's. <laughs> I'm here if you need it. Share. All right. Let's go back. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to bother showing the video, but basically, yeah. <laughs> if you look through the, if you can't see it, but over here you see all this network. So basically, I was going through different apps on my phone, and I could see that, like, for uh, when I opened the Facebook app, there were a bunch of URLs going to facebook.com, and, you know, like, it, it, that was facebook.com. Then the next one I had, can't see it over here, but all of these requests going to Instagram, and when you go to Instagram, it was like, okay, obviously, this is the Instagram app. And the third one, and, you, and I wish I could show you this, but basically over here, if you look at this list, it's all these like arbitrary network names like scorecard research, uh, Google ads, and a bunch of like, there were like 65 packets that went when I opened this app, which was like twice as much as like Facebook and Instagram. And it was my uh, su static subway map app, right? So this is like an image of a subway map that I downloaded is an app. <laughs> And, and it had ads, so like it actually had more network activity than any of the other devices, right? And this is kind of what I mean about like when things are stinky, right? And this is what I mean like when they're like they're gross. It's like you don't need to know the, all the details about how this stuff works, but you're like that's an image. I could literally download that on Google Images and save it on my phone, and you wouldn't be able to set this. Like, how is this okay, right? And those are the kind of questions that I'm really kind of interested in asking. And packet sniffing can really help you ask those questions. So the last project I'm going to show is this project I did with Kashmir Hill last year when I worked at Gizmodo, called, which is called the House That Spied on Me. So basically, Kashmir put up 18 different devices, put in 18 different devices into her smart home. Uh, there were all these Internet of Things devices, and we started this story. We were really interested in understanding. We, were, we didn't really want to like hack the devices. We weren't interested in security vulnerabilities. The only thing we would end up answer was how often are these devices talking to their companies and how often are the companies asking for information from their devices. And so we were like kind of interested in the ambient emissions of a smart home and what that looks like. And the reason we were interested in that is 
six months before that, the FCC, which is like the main regulation body in the U.S. for network traffic, made it legal for ISPs, like so Time Warner Cable and Verizon, to sell your network traffic. Right? So all the stuff, my special router, which I made, which was collecting all this network traffic and logging it, all the traffic my router was seeing was stuff that the ISP was seeing and could sell. Right, so we were basically saying, this is not like, we weren't hacking the device, we were just like acting like Time Warner Cable or Verizon, and we were just curious, like if they were trying to make like an inference of what someone who has a lot of smart devices in their home, what their home looks like, what does that look like, right? And what we basically found was, there was a lot of traffic. Since we like installed the router and started monitoring the traffic, there wasn't a moment's silence in the home. It was like over like a six week period like even even when the family went for vacation which you can see over here right there's this like this slump in network traffic for like a week that's when they were they were away a bunch of devices were still like reaching out and talking to their talking to their servers and it totally makes sense right there's like system up software updates there's a lot of reasons why this could happen but i don't think people realize like how technology works and like what the relationship and contracts are that they're signing up for when they put these devices in their home because they just told that they work seamlessly and it's kind of all like magic. And the things I could tell through this network traffic without any kind of like breaking of encryption or anything was I knew when they woke up and when they went to bed because they had a smart bed and the smart bed would send a signal every time like, like the traffic would change. I knew when Kashmir brushed her teeth because she had a smart toothbrush and it decided to like ping the servers whenever that happened but actually there's one funny moment where like she lives in San Francisco and I was in New York and we had like a remote meeting and I was like yo I don't think you like I messaged DM'd her on Slack I was like did you brush your teeth today because like <laughs> based on the data this doesn't look like it's actually true I was like I have a child okay it's very hard I was like, I was like no judgment but I could but I could tell that right um I knew when they were putting their baby to bed because they had this like Alexa lullaby app they would use and it had a very unique fingerprint. So, ah, uh, Eli went to bed at 7 p.m. today. Ah, uh, today was a rough night, it was 9 p.m. Right? So it was like all of these kind of like signals. I also knew like that they were, they loved difficult people and party down because it turns out Hulu on their smart TV was sending third party unencrypted data to scorecard research, which is like a tracker. I was totally unencrypted, so I actually knew what TV shows they were watching on their smart TV because they had a tracker on it that people didn't realize, right? And like when you started looking, and yeah, and then this happened, I could like basically get all the content that Netflix, all the thumbnails Netflix was putting onto their screen, all came in unencrypted. So based on where like more episode comes up, in the, more episodes comes up in these thumbnails, I knew what TV shows they had watched. Um, they seem to really be into coffee and conversations with comedians because I had like I just like had a bunch of traffic around that. Um, but this is again what I mean about like the difference between how like you understand it and how it smells, right? Like there's this like intuition that we have as we use these devices that don't necessarily correlate to how the HTTPS protocol works, but there are ways to kind of show these vignettes of of these systems that can like be more useful and give agency to the people who use these devices. But overall, not only did these devices leak data about Kashmir and her family, they were also incredibly infuriating to use. And the exploitation of users' data for corporate gain is something we no longer question as citizens on the internet. However, we are beginning to see the handful ramifications of having a world driven by opaque algorithms run by monopolies that are not held to account to the public. This has led to a form of digital colonialism where one has to ask, who is the true beneficiary of your smart home? You or the company mining you? Because if you really think about it, these things don't really work the way, like, I don't know how many of you remember, like, life before Gmail, right? And, like, when Gmail came along, it was, like, 2 MB to 1 gigabyte. And like, yeah, you can have everything. You can have my soul because this like provides me like a level of convenience that I have never experienced and I don't care about the ramifications. Right? That's, I think, like, the contract we all kind of signed up for. But with the Internet of Things, we don't even like them. And they still collect all our data. Like, it's like they, can, they can be incredibly annoying and they still collect our data, right? And if you start thinking about the kind of the economy that kind of defines why this stuff works, it's really revealing. And if you look at the definition on Wikipedia, like, you know, the true source of all truth, uh, colonialism is defined as the policy of a foreign polity seeking to extend or retain its authority over other people or territories generally with the aim of developing or exploiting them 
to the benefit of the colonizing country and of helping the colonies modernize in terms defined by the colonizers, especially in economics, religion, and health. Right? And if you think of every app you have on your phone right now and think of it in that context, what things are being redefined in how you live in society, you can really kind of put this model together and see how it works. So basically my kind of thesis of my argument is that smart things don't make our lives easier. They just make them a different kind of difficult. And fundamentally, humans drive technology. Right? Like literally there's no... <laughs> this is 100% a true slide. I'm not making this up. This is how they did the, the Star Wars bot. But really, like, if you look at how technological systems work and the, the, who they're working for and unpack the complexity of the technology with the management and bureaucracy associated with them, you can see how power really operates. Uh, and that's kind of all I've got. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>